Okay, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amory Morse. She is a board certified adult neurologist with special qualifications in child neurology and sleep medicine. She's the director of the Child Neurology and Pediatric Sleep Medicine Center at Janice Weiss Children's Hospital in Pennsylvania. She has significant clinical experience and interest in pediatric and adult patients with sleep-wake disorders, particularly central disorders of hypersomnolence, such as narcolepsy. In addition, her research interests extend more broadly to include investigating the relationship of sleep with neurological disease. Some of her current research involvement includes participation in studies, evaluating novel therapies and management strategies for hypersomnia disorders, neurodevelopment and sleep and neurocognitive outcomes related to sleep apnea. In addition, Dr. Morse's commitment to sleep health also extends to the community. She has developed a school-based sleep education and surveillance program called Wake Up and Learn, a program developed to provide education about sleep health and perform school-based sleep screening to improve recognition of pediatric sleep disorders in middle and high school students. After successful implement implementation in middle school and high school, it is now extended to include learners in college, medical school, and medical residency programs as well. Dr. Morse envisions a world where sleep can be acknowledged as the vital sign of health, wellness, and performance that it is de designed to be. Welcome, Dr. Morse. You may have seen some of my presentations already. I've had the privilege of working with the Hypersomnia Foundation now for a couple of years. Uh, got the opportunity to work with uh, Lindsay and Claire for the UNITE project. If you haven't been on one of those, please join them. They're awesome. Uh, also got to join on their podcast and then uh, had a virtual presentation at the beginning of this that was shown on Friday, giving kind of an overview. And so one of the things about me is that I'm extraordinarily excited about patient education, engagement, and activation. And that extends even beyond the individual with the disease. It extends into other people who are touched by that person, their family, their colleagues, their children. Those are all really important. So today, some of the things I'm going to talk about are going to be talking about that journey but I'm also going to be talking about how do you utilize the tools that are available to us every single day? Social media. So a lot of us use it as a measure of this is entertainment, but I can tell you that one of the things that I have found really exciting is that it has been a humbling educational experience and it's allowed me a reach that I wouldn't have been able to get in my local community. So the title of the presentation today is Your Journey, Your Directions putting you back into the driver's seat. So this is very purposely selected because number one, many times, one of the concerns patients with central disorders of hypersomnolence describes to me is that they can't drive. So I very frequently use analogies like this to reflect some of the difficulties that a person with central disorders of hypersomnolence may experience, what their goals may be, but then also reinforcing that you are the driver. I, as a physician, am just the GPS. I'm going to give some options in terms of the guidance, but at the end of the day, I'm not living your journey. You're living your journey. So what is a journey? I very frequently talk about medical journeys, and the reason I talk about this is because in the United States, healthcare is broken. Why is it broken? Because it's designed to deliver episodic care. I see you today, I see you in three months, I see you in six months, but your life is going on in between those points. Recognizing that you're in a journey also allows you to respond to when you're having good days and bad days. You can name it. You can define why was this a good day. That empowers you to then be able to communicate to your provider. These are factors that led to a good day. The same thing occurs when you're having a bad day. We're gonna talk about those experiences and using social media also of how do I leverage that so I don't feel alone? So in talking about a journey, this is very frequently kind of the journey we think about. There was a period of time where I didn't have a diagnosis. I felt like I was the same as everyone else. Then there was a the development of a symptom onset. You start seeking care. On average, patients with central disorders of hypersomnolence will seek care from three to five different providers before finally having the eureka moment 
and ultimately having maybe three to five misdiagnoses of that I have a condition. This can be a very long part of the journey that we acknowledge. We acknowledge that there's a delay in diagnosis, but we fail to acknowledge how that impacts us psychologically, how that impacts us medically. And so that can be a very, very significant part. And so we always feel like once we make the diagnosis, that great, we're now gonna put you on the right track. But we sometimes don't even get the opportunity to grieve that period of loss. Yesterday, I was in a session with speaking with a patient who participated in a clinical trial, Katie. And she described very clearly all of the experiences that she missed out on as a teenager because she wasn't diagnosed until she was in college. Very frequently, that's something I hear is the grieving of the experiences that I never got to have, the differences between um, what I'm able to do and my peers. You finally get diagnosis, and then you um, uh, get, get onto a treatment. And one of the things that I like to always point out is that picture for treatment, I very specifically selected because it's two people. It's not a person alone. When we're talking about treatment, it's important to remember that treatment extends beyond the pharmacologic interventions that are provided to you. I always reflect on the very wise words of Julie Flygar, where she describes that social support is a pillar of care and that us in the medical community should be considered malpractice by not prescribing it. And so when I look at that in the social support, social support can be you physically here, but then also being able to look for the extended community through different social media means. In addition to this journey, the other piece that I like to make a point to help in being able to navigate this is that although the journey includes all of those points I just described, your journey changes over time depending on the expectations that you have of yourself and of where you are just societally. Very frequently we see that part of the driver of when people get diagnosed as an adult is because when they're a child, they have parents who are, who are able to support wherever they might be missing. So they're waking up for school, they're making the excuses, they're making their dinner, they're doing their laundry. When they go and make that transition, they no longer can have that balance. And so it's important to understand this because when you are on this journey with your care provider, your care provider is going to need to understand what are your priorities and that should be how we should be shaping our treatment goals. How many times when you go to your physician to talk about what you're experiencing are your treatment goals defined by an upward sleepiness scale? I frequently will tell people when I give presentations that I have yet to have a person come to meet me and tell me that, hi, I'm a 17, that's the reason I'm here. <laughs> Nor have I had the day in the office where the person said, oh my God, I'm a five, this is great. <laughs> you are not defined by a number, you're defined by your personality, your life experiences, your ability to do the things that other people do without having to make that choice every single day of, how am I going to choose to use my time and energy? And the reason I give this illustration is because we also find that in this journey, patients will come in and discuss with their physician, my medication stopped working. And sometimes it's not the medication. The journey changed. And so it's not necessarily that everything has to change in the medication and expose you to potential side effects, of a new medication or a loss of the efficacy you were experiencing, but really a recalibration of what are my expectations right now. So some frequently encountered dilemmas that I see in clinic. I miss too much school or work. I can't do the same thing as my peers. My medication stopped working. My doctor would only prescribe me X, and that's why I'm here. They only use a stimulant or they won't allow me to try and oxidate. How do I know if X is working for me? I want to have a family, and I was told that I can't be on any medications. No one understands. They try, but they just don't understand. They just tell me to get more sleep. The reason I bring up these commonly encountered dilemmas is because you don't necessarily have to wait to seeing your provider to start seeking answers for that. It is really important to understand that there are a lot of resources. So Hypersomnia Foundation has great resources on its website, but social media also has a community of resources that are available. 
So um, in terms of social media, I have a very active presence there, and that was part of the reason they asked me to present today, because they wanted to share why, as a physician, would I go to social media? Many physicians take on the mindset when talking about the internet of don't mistake your Google search with my medical degree. I don't care what you saw on Facebook or Instagram. I'm the one who did the training. The reality is that is a very, very big mistake. You alienate individuals from bringing concerns and new treatment opportunities that you had never considered. Every day I am humbled by the patient interactions that I have. So individuals who are on these journeys experiences with the questions they ask and the suggestions they make. And so part of what made me become active on uh, social media was what else? COVID, right? We had nothing else to do. So I was one of these people who had said, I'm never going on TikTok. I won't even download that app. And then I start seeing a lot of my teenagers telling about all the things that they're learning on TikTok. I tell people, that's how I've learned how to do my makeup now. <laughs> so with that said, there's a lot of really great resources on there. And so I started going on TikTok. I started with just some like comedy things things that were silly, right? Taking some comedians who would talk about sleep and, and kind of dubbing those, right? Seeing what the engagement was, testing the waters. Within a year, I now have about 15,000 followers on TikTok. And what I have developed is a community because there is a very large community who constantly is asking questions. Last year when I was here at APSS, I went in an exhibit hall. I did some videos with different new drugs that were available. The number of people who are going, I had no idea that this was available. How do I utilize this? I had this side effect. How do you navigate that? So it is something that I think is going to just continue to grow. So people ask me, how do, you, um, how do your tactics for advocacy change between platforms, for instance? TikTok, Instagram, which use short videos as a medium, Reddit, which tends to be more anonymous. How did you even choose or decide? So Instagram is, was easy. It was like I can just throw up some pictures, something sleep-related, do a little uh, communication around that. TikTok takes a little bit more planning. <laughs> you have to have the right lighting. You have to have your ring light. You have to be fully prepared, right? You have to have a, a good story to tell. And it has to be brief. People have about a seven-second um, uh, hook, and then um, you lose them. So it has to be brief. Reddit was something that I really never had gone on before because I thought it was too confusing. Every time I'd Google something in about a Reddit page, I felt like I would get lost. It actually was the American Academy of Sleep Medicine that got me on Reddit. So I'm a part of their public um, awareness committee, and they would host events where it was Ask the Expert. And so we had ones on insomnia and hypersomnia, and the one that I was a part was with hypersomnolence. That has been fascinating because of the fact that when you're on these platforms, people are giving full stories, descriptions of where they currently are. So very frequently, things that will be pre presented are things like, I was diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia, and I have cataplexy, but my doctor says I have idiopathic hypersomnia because I didn't go into REM enough. How many have heard that story? I don't have cataplexy, because I don't fall to the ground. I just drop things a lot and my knees buckle. How many have heard that story? The reason I give those illustrations is because these are people who are on that journey and they don't have anyone else to turn to. So they are putting all their struggles out for the world to hear, to be able to hope that someone finds it and responds to it. This clearly is a motivated group who want to make those positive changes because you're here wanting to know how to advance the field. I would encourage you to connect and lift that hand of someone who's saying, I need help, because together our voices are much stronger. Together we make a much louder noise that can't be ignored. 
which brings me on to the next topic. One of the things that very frequently um, uh, gets referenced, because some of these TikToks I also shared in my LinkedIn profile, is about insurances. How many of you, as a patient, have had medications denied by your insurance? How many of you had been on that drug forever, but because you changed your insurance, had that drug denied? How many times have you had a drug denied that's FDA approved for an indication and told, you first must fail a non-FDA approved drug? You must first fail a drug that is considered second or third line. Where we are currently, again, is that in medicine, the people who are experiencing the problems, which are you, the patients, and the people who are trying to help navigate those problems, which is us, the healthcare system, have very little voice against insurances who make up strategies to be able to get medications in the hands of individuals. So I very much enjoy my peer-to-peer -peer phone calls. Okay. And I say that sincerely. I very much do. I don't know how much the person on the other end enjoys them, but I very much do. And so there's sometimes after those phone calls that there's smoke coming out of my ears. And I'm just like, this is not right. Social media has given me a platform. And so, so much so that when I have had presented some of this, such as the strategy that if you, have an ox if you want an oxabate, you must have at least seven cataplexies over a two-week period in order for you to get an oxabate. So to that, my TikTok response was, dear insurance companies, how frequently is it okay for you to fall? How, okay, how frequently is it okay for you to drop things that are important? How frequently is it okay for you to be fearful to hold your baby because you may drop and injure it? This is not okay. It is indicated for diagnosis, not a threshold as to when that diagnosis comes into play. Another situation was I had a patient who was on a drug for two years, two years on this medication. She's a teenager, her parents changed jobs, got a new insurance. New insurance said, can't get that medication anymore. You must first try and fail venlafaxine. Hmm, that's interesting. Non FDA approved drugs over what is an indication. So my response to that typically is, is that the same strategy you use for heart failure? You prefer non FDA approved drugs over those that are considered by the guidelines? First line therapies? Because I would just want to ensure that you're not discriminating against the patient because they have rare disease and you don't understand it. So, with this said, these particular videos have over 50,000 views. Um, and I have had um, the entertaining understanding that when the head of some of these insurances, because I make sure I have it shown. This is for Aetna. This is for Blue Cross Blue Shield. I tag them in it. I tag like Fox News, CNN. Hey, why are we not talking about this, right? But what I can tell you is that when I've spoken to some leadership of specific pharmaceutical companies who've had meetings with these insurances, there's been the comment of, we've, we've heard that one of your KOLs, one of your physicians, don't really like our guidelines too much. So they're hearing it. I say this because you are experiencing the same frustration. Together, our voices are louder. Together, we can make a change by saying this is not OK. Go to social media and utilize your voice. Utilize your emotion. The emotion drives others to react. Your experience, your journey, verbalizing that, sharing that, it makes people go, well, it's just me. I just have bad luck. It's a heart disease. No one gets these drugs. Well, then there's a problem there. So my recommendations to others is that if you're a non-medical expert, what can you do to be more helpful on these platforms? So number one, 
Whatever your expertise is, make sure you're staying within that, right? I'm not gonna go and start talking about being a neurosurgeon because I'm not a neurosurgeon, right? Um, uh, but utilizing life experience, utilizing emotion, utilizing what you feel passionate about is going to drive others to want to engage with you. For physicians, don't be afraid of social media. Very frequent people say to me, I, I, last night, I was at the JW after dinner, and I had several physicians go, you know, I want to do what you do, but I, I just don't think I'd be good at it. I'm like, you think I woke up and I was like, I'm going to be a TikTok star today. No, <laughs> that did not happen. My husband may have another story about that. No. Um, but what it was is, I'm going to try. If I fail, I try again, right? Nothing good happens if you don't take a risk. What's the worst that's going to happen with this? You have a passion. You have a knowledge. Share it. Because when I'm in my hospital, I have the reach for hundreds. When I use a social media platform, I have a worldwide reach. And it's humbling when I'm getting contacts from all over the world asking about, how do I do this? Can you give me guidance on who I can see? This creates a reinforcement of the network that you have right here in this room that is going to become more global. So with that, you may be wondering why I have a dinosaur up here. This is EEPP. -E um, uh, so I brought him with me because he's kind of like a flat Stanley story. I'm a mom. I have two kids. My daughter was hospitalized last month. And I'm going to try not to get emotional. But I share these stories because it's hard to share medical stories. It's hard to share things that hurt you. It's easy to stand up here and say, I look shiny and pretty, and I'm going to make you all excited to go change the world. But I'm going to share with you a story that's hard for me to share publicly so that you know that it's OK to be raw, to be real. My daughter's six years old. In April, she spent three weeks in the hospital. She had pneumonia a pleural fusion and septic shock. If I wasn't home, she would be dead. She's not. She looks amazing. She's back in school, and she's doing great. The reason she's not dead is that I'm fortunate that I'm a physician, but I'm also someone who will advocate. And I'll say, this isn't right. My husband brought, my husband brought her to the pediatrician because I was concerned she had pneumonia. I had a meeting, I couldn't go there. They called, they say, she did, they did the x-ray, she has a left level of pneumonia. She came home, my husband put her in bed. Within 20 minutes, I got finished my meeting, went upstairs, and I found her grunting, retracting, meaning working hard to breathe. Because of COVID, we all have pulse oxes in our house. So I put a pulse ox on her, her heart rate was 155. That shouldn't be that high. Her oxygen was 92. I called the ICU doctor, who's a close friend of mine. I said, when should I bring her to the ER? Because <laughs> I'm like, am I freaking out unnecessarily? He goes, no. By the time I got there, she was in shock. My husband, who's non-medical, had said, I didn't know any better. He didn't know any better. He would have just thought that was a part of the course. My daughter ended up with a chest tube. She was there for a long time. She was on antibiotics for a total course of five weeks. She has a stuffed animal that is a magical stuffed animal. Not EEPP, -E but I'll explain why EEPP -E is here and why he has that name. So she has a little stuffed animal, an Abby Cadabby from Sesame Street. And she did not want to take her oral medications when she finally was able to transition from IV. I don't want to take it, I don't want to take it, I don't want to take it. Well, you know what? Abby Cadabby is magical, but she only has magic to be able to move if you take your medication. So every time she would take her medication and my daughter would go do something, Abby Cadabby would come back and she would be doing something else. She was hanging from the IV pole. She would be in the bathroom. And so there was this magic. So that's my six-year-old. My daughter comes home. And my three-year-old goes, I don't got magic stuffy. <laughs> I said, yes, you do. You have a magic stuffy. 
He goes, which one? I go, you tell me. <laughs> it's dinosaur. So I don't know if any of you watched the show Bluey um, with your kids or anything. So Bluey is these Australian shepherd dogs and they're a little family and the little kids are in the back seat and they'll go, um, Daddy, what does A-A-A-K-K-K-L-L-L-B-B-B spell? And the father would be like, Akahubakabdu. <laughs> So when I asked my son, what's the name of the dinosaur? He said E-E-P-P. So E-E-P-P magically showed up in my luggage. And so now is getting to go on the sleep tour all this week. And so my son will be getting a picture of E-E-P-P being here with all of you, okay? Which will make him really excited. So I share these stories, again, because this is something that is important for us to share. It reminds us of the basic construct that exists. We are all human. We should be human first, lead with kindness, and find the good in every day. Share that with one another. Use social media as a platform. And um, uh, if you do, make sure you make a friend with me. What questions can I answer for you guys? Thank you very much. Any questions from the floor? I have a couple online. Okay. Do you want to try to just yell? And I can repeat it. Do you want to yell? Go ahead, tell me what, what question. Oh, I want to know what your Reddit sub is. Damn good sleep. Oh, that was that one. Okay. Yep. So damn stands for Dr. Amory Morse, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. Thought long and hard about that one. God. I just want to say I love you. Aww. Feelings are mutual. Thank you. Thank you. There is an idiopathic hypersomnia sub on credit. Okay, good. Idiopathic hypersomnia. Okay. I'll have to join that one too because I think I'm just in a narcolepsy one at this point. Hi. I'm looking for a recommendation for um, how do we use community or connecting to find a good doctor in our area who can help us with what we're struggling with. Sure, sure. So I do think Hypersomnia Foundation number one is trying to fill that gap some by having um, a, a repository of different sleep physicians who feel comfortable with diagno diagnosing and managing these disorders. What I generally encourage is, is kind of developing first for yourself, what are your must-haves? What do you want in that person? Some people are like, well, I really want either a man or a woman. That's fine, right? That's sometimes a must have. Sometimes that doesn't make a difference. Finding out people who are going to listen. Do they have availability? I can get in to see you once, but then you disappear from me when I have problems. Do they have more than just a sleep physician? Do they have psychologists? Do they have nutritionists? Do they have other support systems in place? Um, uh, so I would say in, in, utilizing, in utilizing social media to identify physicians who may be able to elevate you on your path, um, uh, trying to avoid the kind of slander approach, right? Don't ever go to this doctor, the worst doctor ever. Da, da. But more so, how do we, hey, I have a doctor who I'm seeing, they have great bedside manner. They really understand the disease process. They ask me great questions about reproductive planning and having a family and all that. So I think social media can be utilized in a way to share the positive experiences because we're much more likely to go to the internet to just slash and burn, right? And so if we can utilize it to then elevate, I think that will also create more pockets. The other reason that's positive, it forces behavioral changes for physicians. When they start seeing that other care providers are being specifically called out for being awesome, everyone wants a gold star. Everyone wants to be awesome. So uh, it basically reinforces bad behavior for physicians when they see negative reviews. They just become even more frustrated. Why do I even bother? Um, and I would say, ultimately, I think most clinicians want to do a good job. The challenge with our medical training is that it reinforces an insecurity to ever being wrong or saying you don't know. So I think that's a big piece on our side that we need to be able to move away from. What other questions? Yes? So these uh, prior authorization uh, criteria, like the, the cataplexy threshold. Yes. OK, 
okay, sorry. The, uh, the, these kind of prior authorization criteria like the cataplexy thresholds, economically I, under, I understand where they come from, but clinically, yeah. uh, documentarily, where do they come from? Sure, so um, uh, twofold. One, economically, I don't know if they actually have a good basis, right? So very frequently people will cite the cost of the drug and that's the reason. And so one of the things that my response is is that my understanding of insurances is it's based on mitigating risk. When I have a person who has a poorly controlled disease process, I'm not mitigating risk. So even though you may be saving up front the $10,000, you may actually be incurring higher healthcare utilization because you have an inadequate management of a disease, which is that it's gonna to lead to worse outcomes. So the economics, I think, could probably be debated. But the where they get them very frequently is looking at how the clinical trial was designed. And so clinical trials are designed with specific thresholds, not because that defines the disease, but the statistics that are going to be most likely that they can show a difference. If I enroll someone who has three cataplexy events per month, being able to show a statistically significant improvement is gonna be much harder than someone who may have 14 a day going down to four a week, right? And so therefore, insurances utilize that, although that is not about the, a part of the diagnostic criteria or anything else. So they use a pick and choose of what suits me best. Okay, I have a question from one of, um, someone online. I'd love a list of accounts to follow that put out good infographics and other information that's brief or easy to digest that are easily shareable to educate others. Yeah, so there are a ton of really great um, resources online from a wide context. So you have people who are clinicians like myself who are doing sleep education, but there also is a growing field of people who are, who are um, uh, trained as sleep coaches who have a significant enthusiasm around sleep and have some training around kind of lifestyle management, et cetera. I would say that I see the biggest growth and that type of resource on Instagram over TikTok. There are some, there are some sleep docs on TikTok. There are also organizations like the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's education um, organization that they have some really great infographics. Um, uh, there is, um, I'm going to blank on all of them right now. I'm going to need to get my phone and like give you guys a list. Um, I actually, I know there's the sleep gap is a good one. There is, um, I'm going to have to look at my phone. I'm going to have to give you the list. I'm not going to remember them off the top of my head, but I can, I can put that together. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm a member of the board of the Klein-Levin Syndrome Foundation, and one of the challenges that we're experiencing on social media is that those of us who are running it are over the age of 20, and people under the age of 20 are not on the platforms that we're on. Mm -hmm. How do you balance the newer platform's um, lack of ability to provide privacy? We're, one of the things that we've done successfully over the past 15 years is create a um, a KLS support group on Facebook because it's mm -hmm. private and people can share their experiences and ask questions about treatment options. And you can't do that on TikTok or on Instagram or on Snapchat. How do you find that your younger patients um, find community on these platforms where there isn't that option? So, so it's interesting. That, that's a very good point in regards to where you're actually hosting a community event versus creating the network. So the social media platforms where you can't necessarily host the events, they're great at creating the network. So there still is a direct messaging. You can friend one another. You can follow one another. There's a lot of times, like you'll even see if you were to go on any of my accounts, especially on TikTok, where patients will, will either stitch or duet um, my stuff or I'll do that to theirs. And so that is another part of community that is very valuable. Now with that stated, you can also then add in your links to it to be able to drive them to the other sites. And that very frequently can be very, very successful. So if you have, for instance, like Hypersomnia Foundation has, they're hosting Unite on their, through their website, they can still utilize those platforms for that reach, gain more community, and then be able to respond. Because a lot of times what you're getting from those social media platforms is actually an understanding of what actually is the pulse of what is going on and matters, matters to that different generation. Um, and sometimes it's worldly different from what your perceptions are. You're welcome. 
Any other questions? So are we awake? We ready to take on a day? All right, get your phones out, start scrolling. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.